Well, actually, first of all, good morning. And it's a real great pleasure to, to be here physically. I think it's actually my first uh, physical academic event since the pandemic started, I think. Uh, and it's uh, wonderful to be in such a great city as Amsterdam and in such a beautiful uh, room as this one. When I was preparing uh, this keynote speech, of course, I had to do a little bit of a research about uh, where it was going to be delivered. And I understand that this is a room which has been named by the Dutch historian Johan Huizinga. But of course, I had to do a little bit of research and try to find a good quote uh, with which to start uh, this keynote speech. And I think that uh, Johan Huizinga said, history can predict nothing, except that changes will never come about in the form in which they have been anticipated. And I think this is a really, very, very good uh, and appropriate uh, quote. I don't think that many of us uh, have been anticipating a few months ago the world in which we are currently living. Uh, so I think I will not try to, today to make any predictions. I'm not going to tell you between now and the end of the mandate of this commission, we are going to do A, B, and C in terms of our European Union trade policy. I'm going to, to try to share with you some thoughts uh, about uh, the role of European Union trade policy in the current geopolitical mm -hmm. environment and where I think we should be heading over the next uh, over the next uh, few years. So first, a few words uh, about uh, the geopolitical environment. The Russian military aggression of Ukraine uh, implies that war has returned to Europe. It is an unprovoked, unjustified military action, which is closely violating international law and undermining European and global security and stability. But this military aggression, it is further exacerbating a trend that we have been witnessing already from before, from a rule base to a power-based international order, and which is therefore undermining decades of positive developments around the world we had actually brought chair prosperity. <clears throat> this is a new environment that requires decisive actions, and the European Union will do everything possible to sustain and to strengthen a rule based trading order, both through multilateral action and through bilateral cooperation. But at the same time that we act multilaterally and that we engage bilaterally, we also need to be sure that we are well equipped with the tools that are needed to operate effectively in a much more hostile world, and that we are ready to use those tools when necessary, as indeed we have done uh, with the very decisive sanctions that we have been applying uh, in response uh, to the Russian uh, aggression. So in this geopolitical environment, uh, I'm building upon the trade policy strategy that we adopted last year, where if you remember we were basically talking about the need for a trade policy which is committed to openness, is committed to sustainability, but which is also assertive. What it is that I think are going to be the main lines of action to, for the years ahead. Let me start uh, with the multilateral trade framework, because we are firm believers that the multilateral framework remains the basis for stability in international trade. But we also need to be realistic. I think we need uh, to recognize that the process of WTO reform, to which we still are strongly committed, is probably proving quite challenging. And it's certainly going to require some degree of what I would like to call a strategic uh, patience. We need, therefore, to identify what are the issues within the reform at the end of the WTO which are doable and achievable in a medium term perspective. And let me just highlight a, a few. We continue to believe that there's a strong priority to work toward restoring a functioning dispute settlement system, not just because of its micro value, but because of its macro significance. You cannot have a rule based trading order if you don't have a functioning dispute settlement system. So I would say this is and continues to be a fundamental priority for our multilateral agenda. We need to see how the WTO can be contributing to our broader sustainability challenges, where it is the response to the pandemic, where it is the challenges of food security, where it is the environmental sustainability challenges. 
we need to see how we can actually integrate uh, in the WTO bilateral agreements, which is one of the main source of dynamism in terms of the significant number of countries are clearly interested and committed in Geneva to work the realization of the rules of international trade. And the WTO needs to be able to, uh, to incorporate uh, those elements into its architecture. <laughs> and we also need uh, to work towards ensuring the improved disciplines, both on agriculture and industrial substance. So those are, from our point of view, in a medium term perspective, what are the issues that we need to be able to see how to make progress within the framework of the WTO. We are basically four weeks away from a very important ministerial conference in the Geneva. And of course, if agreeing on things multilateral is always difficult, the new geopolitical context and the Russian aggression makes things particularly challenging. I'm not going to give you a prediction about what the ministers will be able to, to agree in the four weeks time. But from my point of view, at the very least, one would hope uh, that there is a clear recognition uh, by ministers in the WTO that this is an organization that needs to be formed, that there should be fundamental focus over the next uh, two years in developing a reform agenda, including the, on bringing back a, a functioning the dispute settlement uh, system. And hopefully beyond this, we should also be able at least to make uh, some steps uh, in showing that the WTO is able to respond uh, to global trade challenges. And I mentioned the pandemic, uh, I can mention food security, I can mention environmental sustainability. Now, how far we will be able to go in COVID time, as I said, I'm not going to predict. I'm happy, of course, uh, to further the debate uh, in the time that we will have for, for <coughs> questions and answers. But in any case, I would say that this is the sense uh, of direction and main message which I would like to pass is that I think it would be a profound mistake to think that because we are in a much more challenging geopolitical environment, the WTO has lost relevance. I think precisely because we are in a much more challenging geopolitical environment, it is particularly important to have a good base basis of cooperation, a baseline that countries accept and where they respect the rules. Let me now move uh, to the bilateral uh, agenda. Um, I think that the time has come to build a new consensus in the European Union on how to advance bilateral trade agreements. Now, the European Union has been very active. We have the largest network uh, of trade agreements uh, in the world. Even after uh, 2015, uh, the election of Donald Trump uh, we managed to get uh, ratified with a strong majorities in the European Parliament our agreement with Japan, our agreement with Vietnam, our agreement with Singapore. So there's no way to say that there has been a paralysis in terms uh, of the process uh, of um, ratification of trade uh, agreements. But we are living now in a geopolitical context in which we think uh, this is much stronger case to further advance in our bilateral uh, trade agenda. From the geopolitical point of view, we need to aim at closer partnerships with key trading partners. From the economic point of view, we need to ensure the access to goods and raw materials just to reduce our dependencies vis-a-vis -vis certain suppliers. We need to also give new opportunities to market access to our exporters and uh, connecting the European economy to external sources of growth continues to be in extremely important. 85% of global economic growth is generated outside the European Union, but also from a sustainability perspective. We need to make sure that we use our trade relationship to build platforms for cooperation in support of the promotion of sustainable development. That's why the sustainable development component uh, of the European Union trade agreements is not an addition, it's not something that you do on top of the other things that you do in trade agreements. It is, from our point of view, an absolutely central element of the balance uh, to get the uh, trade agreements supported uh, in the European uh, Union. And as you probably know, we have been engaged in, the, in a review of our policy on sustainable development uh, on trade agreements. 
and towards the end uh, of next month, we will come forward with a communication where we would make a number of uh, recommendations about how this policy could be further uh, improved. And it is clear to, to us that it's going to be critical if we are going to be able to see how we can advance uh, in the bilateral uh, trade uh, agenda. Now, as I said, uh, I'm not going to give you predictions, but I think uh, that there is going to be an acceleration of trade negotiations. We are quite close to concluding the, a trade agreement uh, with New Zealand. We are not yet there, but we are quite close uh, to concluding the, a trade uh, agreement uh, with New Zealand. A bit more challenging with Australia, but again, the important uh, partner, uh, also particularly important in the new geopolitical environment, where we absolutely need to find alternative sources uh, of supply of raw, of raw materials. We have decided uh, after a long pause to relaunch uh, trade negotiations uh, with uh, India. But I think that you are going to see an acceleration and an intensification of the bilateral trade agenda in the European Union. And quite frankly, it's also obviously linked to the new situation that has been created uh, by the Russian invasion of Ukraine. It is going to require significant effort of diversification to reduce dependencies uh, from Russia. It is also implied that we are going to be losing the important market uh, for the European Union and that we need uh, to find uh, alternative, uh, alternative uh, markets uh, for European uh, Union exporters. I mean, of course, the big, uh, it is not just a question about negotiating and concluding your agreements. You need to be able to deliver on those agreements that you have uh, concluded. You need to get them through the process of ratification. Uh, there is, uh, well, I mean, we will have to, uh, later today a discussion about Mercosur, so I will not say a lot about that. I prefer to be with uh, for the discussion that will take place uh, later on. But it is clear that from both a geopolitical and economic point of view, this is an extremely important agreement uh, for the European uh, Union. At the same time, it's a very challenging agreement because, as I said, uh, any agreement in the European Union needs to have the balance between the generating the new economic opportunities for benefit on those sides and being able to deliver on sustainability. And without the two components, I don't think that you would actually get uh, support for trade agreements in the European Union. How to get the balance uh, right uh, on this issue in Mercosur will be critical uh, in the process of ratification of what I think is clearly an extremely important uh, agreement uh, from the European, uh, from the European uh, uh, perspective. I have talked uh, about uh, classical uh, trade agreements, but it's clear that uh, free trade agreements is not the only tool of engagement uh, that we have uh, with uh, our trading partners. We need uh, to be able to develop uh, new approaches, particularly to better address uh, the increasingly important nexus between trade, uh, technology, and security issues. That's why it was so important uh, to establish uh, the Trade and Technology Council uh, with the United States. And in a way, the war in Ukraine has shown uh, the relevance and importance uh, of the TTC even more than at the time uh, that uh, we created it. In relationship with the United States has clearly improved uh, in relation to what it was uh, under the previous uh, administration, but it is still a lot of work that we need to be able to do Better to strengthen uh, our cooperation, particularly when it comes to dealing with uh, new regulatory challenges. And that's why uh, the second ministerial meeting of the TTC, which will take place in uh, France uh, the 15th and the 16th of May, will be an important signal uh, of the continuous commitment uh, towards the transatlantic, uh, towards the transatlantic uh, agenda. So I have talked about the multilateral, I have talked about uh, the bilateral. Uh, engagement, but the third pillar uh, of European Union trade policy is, of course, uh, the efforts to strengthen the, our autonomous instruments, our autonomous tools. And there we are basically talking about three types of instruments. By the way, none of these instruments are trade policy instruments, even if all of them uh, have a trade policy relevance. We have a number of instruments whose purpose is essentially to ensure a level playing field or to promote reciprocity, whichever 
when you want to you want to call it. You have a number of instruments which are basically aiming at advancing the sustainability objectives. And then you have some instruments which have much more of a security rationale behind it. As far as the level playing field the reciprocity instruments, uh, two important developments. After almost 10 years, I think, uh, of discussions in the Council uh, and the European Parliament, uh, we finally have now an agreement uh, on the introduction uh, of an international procurement instrument. <coughs> That would introduce an element uh, of reciprocity in government procurement, aim being, of course, uh, to improve uh, to improve access uh, to third country markets, but uh, with the possibility, if those achieve, if that is not achieved, to introduce uh, to introduce restrictions in our market. We are also advancing uh, quite uh, well in the trial of discussions on a new instrument to respond to foreign subsidies to ensure a level playing field in the single market. So there, apart from the traditional tools of anti-dumping, counter revenue duties, you will have a new reciprocity instrument on government procurement, and you will have an instrument to ensure that if there's evidence about the foreign subsidy that is having an impact in the single market, you have the capacity to react. A second uh, range uh, of autonomous instruments are those which are guided uh, by sustainability objectives. By the way, none of those instruments are trade <coughs> policy instruments. All of these have been uh, developed uh, in response uh, to policies outside of trade. Although a number of those instruments have significant uh, trade policy implications, and that's the reason why us in the trade have been closely involved uh, in the design of those instruments. To ensure compatibility with our international commitments and those of the WTO, but also to try to ensure that the external dimension is sufficiently integrated in the design of those instruments. Now, there will be a possibility to discuss later the, today uh, the corporate due diligence uh, instruments, but of course, two extremely important instruments is also the proposal for the border carbon adjustment measure. Where again uh, we are making significant progress in the legislative procedure and the proposal for an instrument to deal and respond uh, to the global challenge of deforestation. Now, these are all instruments uh, which, as I said, uh, are autonomous in nature, but at the same time, they need clearly need to be embedded in a wider work of reinforced engagement and cooperation, including through our trade uh, agreements. And finally, the third uh, dimension, which is a very novel dimension to, for us in the European Commission, is the trade uh, and security nexus. Within a new geopolitical environment, it's clearly going to become increasingly important that the European Union to, needs to act to defend uh, its interests, to respond uh, to the pressures of the weaponization of trade. We will have a discussion here on the anti coercion instruments. And again, I will not say a lot in my initial presentation because I think I will probably want to reserve my comments for the, for the debate. But of course, this is not uh, just the, the, the first time that we actually introduce an element which is uh, connected uh, to security. We already introduced uh, in the previous commission uh, in European Union framework uh, legislation on foreign direct investment screening. And I have to say that we have been extremely active in the implementation of this legislation. Just to, to give you some data, in 2021, the commission was involved in the screening of 400 cases of investment within the European Union. And actually, if you look into the sanctions that we applied in the context of our reaction to the Russian invasion, it was also the first time that in the, in the particular context of the adoption of sanctions that we introduced export controls at the European level to, for a number of key technologies, which again is something that previously had never been done at the European level. But clearly, this is a new challenge, how to manage this trade and security interface. And again, it's going to be an important uh, factor as we develop uh, our uh, policies in a much more challenging uh, geopolitical environment. So all in all, uh, I think that's uh, what I believe are going to be the challenges. A strong continuous commitment uh, towards WTO reform. 
but knowing that this is something which is going to take time, which is going to require significant efforts to, to alliance building, to work with our countries uh, in the Geneva. Increase uh, focus on moving forward on the bilateral uh, agenda, both in the ratification of those agreements that we have concluded, but also further developing our network of, of trade agreements. And you have noted a strong focus on the Indo-Pacific as being an area where we obviously need to be more present. We already have agreements uh, with Korea, with Japan, uh, with um, Vietnam and Singapore. So we already have a very important network of trade agreements in the region. But I think uh, it is clearly the intention to strengthen uh, our uh, economic presence there. And I did not mention, by the way, Indonesia, but again, we have been negotiating also for quite some time that with Indonesia, there's going to be an effort to see where we can actually also see how to bring those negotiations to to, to, to conclusion. And lastly, consolidating the, our uh, uh, autonomous toolbox uh, on these three areas, reciprocity, sustainability, and also increasingly how to deal with the trade and security nexus, and how to be a position to react uh, in those cases in which trade is being weaponized uh, to try to put pressure on the European Union or, or the, the member states. And of course, uh, this is something where we hope that having legislation in the European Union will have a deterrent effect. But at the end of the day, if you need uh, to use the instrument, you should be able to do it uh, and to do it uh, in an effective, uh, in an effective uh, manner. I mean, I think the, the speed with which we have been able to adopt sanctions uh, in the response to the aggression of, uh, of the aggression of Ukraine shows that in a situation of a crisis, the European Union is ready to act rapidly and to be effective. But in reality, we also need to be prepared to be effective, not only in the situation of an immediate crisis, but also to challenge, uh, to respond to the different challenges that we are going to be increasingly facing in a more tense uh, geopolitical, uh, geopolitical environment. So I think I would uh, leave it there, and I hope uh, that there's enough time uh, to answer the uh, transparent questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, I think the topic of um, yeah, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the new problems which emerge by the, um, by the security trade uh, con um, um, uh, connection, um, yeah, we, will, we need, need to speak more about that today. It was not originally anticipated when we started our project uh, one and a half, two years ago. Um, but yeah, now it's, it's new on the agenda. Anyway, we have some time now for Q&A. Um, so I'd like you to, uh, to, to ask you to raise your hand if you have any questions or comments to the, to the keynote, keynote lecture. Yeah. Well, we can start a bit like whether uh, I wanted to ask uh, whether you could like speculate a little bit about which issues are likely to come up in this trade policy review a bit. We obviously don't know where it's going to go, but whether... Uh, uh, whether, for instance, issues of also more internal reforms about the role of the um, chief trade enforcement officer or the single entry point, whether that would also be on the agenda right now, or rather only issues about the, the templates for the trade agreements and the commitments to the International Labour Organization conventions or things like this, but whether there would also be some internal institutional reforms. <coughs> Uh, yes, well, I mean, I will be, I will need to be a little bit cautious because we are coming in the process of finalizing a, a communication that we need to put in their service uh, consultation. So I cannot uh, give you a definitive uh, sense about what this communication would say, but we would certainly want uh, to look into all aspects uh, of sustainable development policy in our trade agreements. I mean, the focus of the review it is uh, looking into the role of sustainability in our trade agreements, which implies not only looking into the trade and sustainable development chapters, it implies looking into the entirety of the trade agreement. It implies looking into the design of the agreement, how to try to ensure that, that uh, our, the sustainability component of our uh, trade agreements is more responsive to those issues which are particularly relevant for the country that you are the, uh, negotiating with. I mean, you have mentioned this word template, but I think that uh, we probably need to move away a little bit on this 
template mentality. This is the model and we pursue it no matter what with all the trading partners. So we always have to be something for common elements. But again, one of the lessons we've seen we are likely to go from our review is that you need to be really be much more specific. The sustainability challenge with New Zealand are not the same as the sustainability challenge with India. So how to try to, to be more granular, more, more looking into the things that, uh, that really matter with the country concerned. We are going to be looking into the whole process of implementation and enforcement. And that, of course, implies also looking into the vote of the single entry front, the vote of the CTO, exactly the ways that to facilitate uh, handling the complaints related to sustainability, how to, how to handle that. Knowing that I think it's a little bit perhaps of a, a mistake to look into sustainability basic basically from a complaint-based perspective. I think uh, there are certain cases in which, of course, you need to handle complaint, but they also fit in with what matters more is to identify which are the particular implementation priorities and how you can actually focus energy on getting those implementation priorities uh, moving, the, moving forward. And last but not least, I mean, this is not a secret, but the big uh, policy debate uh, in the European Union has been about uh, whether or not in certain circumstances that could be a vote for the trade sanctions. The approach of our sustainability chapters have always been first anchored on multilateral agreements, where it is on the ILO, where it is on the multilateral environmental agreements, and very much based on a cooperation approach. This being said, there's a debate, but under certain particular serious circumstances, there might not be a case as a last resort to make use of trade sanctions. I'm not going to tell you what the communication is going to say, but that is going to be one of the one of the issues that we will be tackling in one way or another. Thank you. Um, I think we have one other committee in the room, and then I collect two comments from the room, and then one round of um, question and comments from the from the online audience. Um, yes, Mr. Uh, my name is Scott Felix, I'm a PhD candidate from the University of Amsterdam. Uh, I was I was wondering uh, if perhaps uh, the last poster uh, was the position of the Commission on the EU-China investment agreement. Uh, I'm especially curious uh, about this uh, trade and security nexus or geopolitical economic dimension uh, of this agreement, because I, I think it's quite still salient in this regard. From its it, the negotiation started, I think, uh, when the perception of China's global power was quite different than it is now. And of course, uh, the involvement of the European Parliament also I think, changed quite a lot. So, so I was wondering if you could share what the current, the current Commission's position on that is. Thank you. Well, the EU-China uh, Investment Agreement, uh, it is a good agreement. It is an agreement that was actually negotiated uh, to level the playing field uh, with China. That includes a number of important uh, commitments uh, from China in terms uh, of market opening. That also, for the first time, it implied uh, China accepting the number of binding commitments uh, on sustainability, both on the environment side uh, and on the labor side. And by the way, there have been recent uh, indications about the progress by China on ratifying those ILO conventions that, that China had not yet ratified. So I don't know where they have done that in connection with the kind of stuff, <coughs> the indication is good, uh, good, uh, good news. So we certainly continue to think that there was a rationale uh, behind uh, that agreement, that is an agreement that has a value. At the same time, it's very clear that any agreement needs to have the right political context. And it is impossible to imagine that you would get uh, an agreement uh, ratified in the European Union while China is uh, applying uh, sanctions on a number of members uh, of the European Parliament, while China continues to be involved on the weaponization of trade against the member states of the European Union. And as you know, uh, we have started a dispute settlement procedure uh, against China in the WTO because of the unacceptable uh, action that China adopted informally vis-a-vis -vis -vis Lithuania and threatening the, threatening the integrity of the single market. So without a change of those conditions, I don't think there's a question at this point in time of thinking of ratification of the, of the CAI. Now, as I said, the CAI continues to be a good agreement. Uh, circumstances may change, but I mean, at this point in time, uh, we don't see a path forward for the ratification. Maria? Yes, so thank you very much for your um, illuminating speech. I, I wonder, you mentioned the multilateral as the first sort of 
priority um, of EU trade policy. And then you mentioned unilateral instruments. I wonder, is there a certain tension between the two? Um, and in particular, I'm thinking, so if you look at different unilateral instruments used uh, to achieve sustainability, which is the thing that I'm working on, depending on the design of the unilateral measure in question, there can be more or less multilateral um, elements in that instrument. And I, and you know, there, there is sometimes a criticism that the EU is moving forward with unilateral measures thereby abandoning <clears throat> its commitment to achieve agreement in cooperation with other countries. Of course, in the treaty, we have a clear preference, normatively speaking, for multilateral policy. But I wonder, what is your view on how a potential tension could be, is there a tension? And secondly, could it be reconciled if so through uh, you know, a, certain, a certain design of unilateral measures that still uh, rely to the extent possible on cooperation and multilateral uh, initiatives. Well, I mean, let's uh, talk uh, about the different type uh, of autonomous measures. I prefer that unilateral of autonomous, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> of autonomous uh, measures. Now, if you actually <coughs> look into those autonomous measures which are uh, guided by the need to have a level playing field, by a need to have reciprocity, it is clear that in all of those areas, our preference would always be to, to have uh, uh, negotiated outcomes. Certainly, when it comes to public procurement, our objective is, is to have better access to third country markets. But uh, knowing that if at the end of the day you cannot achieve a negotiated outcome, you may need to take action to level the playing field, always in respect of your international commitment. So we obviously not going to take an action that breaches our commitments under the GPA or that breaches our commitments under bilateral agreements. Now, when it comes to actually responding to foreign subsidies, of course, our preference and our objective, challenge will be, will be to negotiate how to modernize and to strengthen the rules on subsidies in the WTO. But we know that this is an issue that is going to to take time, which is not going to be a simple one. And we cannot have a situation that under such standards we have negotiated the rules that are needed at the WTO level, that we don't have instruments to defend the, the interests of our companies in the European market. Again, it is critical that you design the, those instruments carefully so that you do it in a manner which is consistent with our international obligations. We said we really continue to want to ensure that any action that we take is carefully designed and and it's consistent with our international obligations. Now, when uh, you talk about uh, sustainability, okay, if you care about certain global environmental challenges, and it's clear that you cannot just think in such time that there will be a multilateral agreement where everyone takes the action that will be needed to respond uh, to a global environmental challenge. And you need to be able to, to act. Uh, and it is that's very much the rationale uh, of what we have been doing the, in terms of the border carbon adjustment measure, the, what we are now doing with our proposals on the deforestation. But at the same time, first, we need to ensure that you design in a manner which is WT compatible. But beyond that, that you incorporate into the design an element of dialogue and cooperation to, with, uh, with uh, certain countries. I mean, just to give you an example, the, one of the issues that I think is significant about the border carbon adjustment measure is not only that it has been carefully designed, uh, that it is not discriminatory in nature, but also that the measure is going to be introduced after a significant lead time. It is only by 2026 that uh, the measure will become applicable and will do in a very progressive manner. So there's a lot of scope between now and then to see how you can actually uh, address concerns that certain countries may have in terms of how to comply with the requirement. And you also have the possibility of developing certain areas bilateral agreements, they said that you, they also, as you know, ideas about the, a climate coalition, so what sometimes is being called a climate club. So there are different ways in which you can actually act autonomy, autonomy, but at the same time to, to develop a cooperative approach vis-a-vis -vis others. And as indeed, as I mentioned, we increasingly see that one of the important goals of our trade agreements, particularly the sustainability component of our trade agreements, is how to create platforms for dialogue and cooperation to, with certain countries which may have questions, may have concerns about the application of our, the, of our autonomous instruments. Then finally, the anti-coercion instrument is a very special instrument, and again, we have the opportunity to discuss that uh, in more detail. Again, it has been carefully designed in a manner that uh, we would ask to act in a way which is not in contradiction with our WTO commitments, but which at the same time, if there's something which is clearly a breach of public international law, 
and uh, we justify the rapid reaction, then we will have the capacity, the capacity to, to react. So I think uh, this is perhaps a tension. I don't think there's a contradiction. You just simply need to be sure that you are careful in the design and that you you complement uh, any action that you take autonomously with an effort for dialogue and cooperation to, with your countries, where it is bilaterally or where it is multilateral. I mean, for instance, multilateral, I have not mentioned, but uh, one of the issues that we took an initiative uh, last year with a number of countries was to how to revitalize discussions about faith and environment and faith and climate in the WTO, how to make uh, the Commission on Faith and Environment in the WTO function better as a forum for dialogue and deliberation on faith-related climate measures. And that's one of the issues that we will also want to pursue as part of the effort uh, on, uh, on WTO reform. Thank you. Uh, Maria and Philip, could you help me with one round of online comments, please? Yes, of course. So we have um, one or two questions uh, in the virtual space, and we will ask to unmute the people and to ask the questions directly uh, to the speaker. So it will be two, so we collect them, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think we can do two questions at a time. Uh, hi. Uh, uh, I have a question about uh, the EU policy regarding the Middle East. You see, the uh, European Union relies on the energy exports from Russia and given the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, I was wondering what are EU's grandest strategies to further energy trades with the Middle East, particularly with Iran, with which a series of parallel negotiations are ongoing? We will take the second question and also, uh, when you ask a question, could you briefly introduce yourself? Uh, that would be uh, I am Ali Reza Salinejad. I am a researcher at the University of Tehran. Hello, can you unmute yourself? You get this second question. <laughs> Perhaps we move forward with that question yeah, yeah. and see if we can solve it out. Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, there's a particular political uh, context in terms of the uh, relations with Iran. So I would not enter the, I would not enter into that. I would actually perhaps answer it a bit more generally. I mean, it's clear that uh, one of the lessons that we learned uh, from the current situation is that we need to become uh, independent from the Russia when it comes uh, to energy sources, and that's going to be a huge uh, uh, effort uh, for the European uh, for the European Union is certainly going to imply the looking into alternative uh, sources of uh, of supply, including of course uh, in the Middle East. It's also going to imply an acceleration of the effort uh, to uh, to move towards uh, renewable energy. I mean, the Commission will be making a proposal I think next week uh, with this year communication about how we can actually achieve. Uh, uh, independence uh, from uh, Russia in terms of uh, gas uh, and oil, and I would not. I, I would suggest that you look into this communication that will be issued by the by the Commission. I think the 18th of May. Okay, thank you very much. I have did it work out with the. Um, so, so, so we have a, a second question uh, by Kuran. Um, I think you are unmuted, so you can directly address the speaker and ask a question. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, cool, fine. Um, yeah, I was wondering about it, about the, the objective of open strategic autonomy, which we learned a lot about, or we heard a lot about um, after COVID. Um, and I wonder in the current context, which is even more complex, it seems to me, in terms of the objective of strategic autonomy, how we can balance the openness um, against that objective. Thanks. When we bought uh, our trade policy communication to last year, we very deliberately made a choice. We don't want just to write a document uh, that is going to say what uh, the European Commission is going to do on trade policy over the next few years. We want to do a document which is a little bit more strategic, which tries uh, to reflect uh, how a European Union trade policy can uh, situate itself in what is a much more uh, challenging geopolitical environment. So I think that the approach that we outlined uh, of open strategic autonomy in that communications continues to be 
totally relevant uh, in the new geopolitical context. And one of the things we have been trying to convey in my presentation is that the element of openness is going to be very, very central. I mean, uh, we obviously need uh, to be well equipped and a lot of effort has been done uh, over the last uh, few years on developing our autonomous toolbox. But we need at the same time to be able to be sure that, that we continue an openness agenda. And that's why both the support for multilateralism and the support for an active bilateral trade agenda is going to be extremely important. And I, but we need to see, as I said, uh, I, would no, I don't want to make predictions. It would be very unwise, as uh, the famous Dutch historian said, to make any predictions about what, what is going to be happening over the next uh, two years. But our sense is that when you actually discuss now with the member states, when you discuss with the different political groups uh, in the European Parliament, uh, there is a clear recognition that we need uh, to put emphasis on the openness part of the open strategic autonomy strategy and that it is uh, not only multilateralism but of course uh, it doesn't just depend on the european union you need everyone to move forward in order to achieve succeed multilaterally or at least you need multilateral uh, progress but also what we can do with willing trading partners to the bilateral trade agenda with a lot of emphasis on finding a way to ratify the agreements that we have pending in latin america and with a lot of emphasis about also strengthening the, our presence in the Indo-Pacific. And of course, let's not forget also all the important geopolitical challenges uh, that are now there in our neighborhood, the new to a new perspective uh, for countries like uh, Ukraine, hopefully when we can move away from the current engagement and the continued strategic interest in finding ways uh, to have it is deeper engagement with the African continent. So I think that uh, this openness agenda is going to be, in my view, something that there uh, is going to be increasingly focused in terms of our uh, of our uh, trade policy. Yeah. Thank you very much. I have another uh, question from the audience from a good doctor from the University of Hull. Uh, yes, hello. Thank you. Very interesting, uh, Timerson, and of course, clearly great experience over a long time. Now, I have a question. The European Union is, of course, not a single unified actor. And at the policy making ratification, there are different stages of policy making. Uh, we have the European Commission, the Council of Ministers, and the European Parliament. Now, leaving aside the issue of the tensions and the differences between the Council of Ministers, which make up governments in effect and the European Parliament, which sometimes are almost protest voted type of people who show up on the MP side of things, there's no obvious correlation in terms of strength. Leaving that aside, the European Commission itself is not unified. So for example, coming from the point of view of the North American story negotiations, uh, repeatedly trade negotiators have told me in my research over the past 20 years, that uh, it, it really makes a difference whether you get to DG trade, DG external relations, DG agricultural development. Now, the European Commission is, let's say, a technocratically oriented organization. And even here, there is a complete difference in perspectives. Veto inclined actors have many veto points, in other words. They can go to the different DGs, they can go to the European Parliament now. How do you negotiate in good faith as one of your, you know, one of your partners? How do you negotiate with you when they know they're going to come across a yes here, but a no there, and an obstacle later on? Mm. I, I'm afraid, I mean, I have been working on European Union trade policy for almost 30 years now, and I don't recognize the picture that you are, to, that you are to describing. Now, first, within the European Commission, when it comes to negotiating trade agreements, it is very clear the responsibility which is led by DG Trade. And of course, DG Trade always uh, does this within a framework of cooperation with other Commission services. Of course, uh, when it comes to agricultural negotiations, DG Agriculture has a very important role, and you integrate it within your negotiating team uh, all the different parts of the European Commission under the overall uh, political supervision of the college and if at any point in time there's an internal tension i mean 
I would never, I haven't seen a bureaucracy anywhere in the world where there are no internal tensions. And I can tell you, you go to the US government, if you go to the Japanese government, you will find the same tension. Whenever there's an internal tension, there's a mechanism to, 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 to resolve those. And I have never really seen there's a negotiation. We have had this situation that did trade wants to go in the one direction, did the agriculture wants to go in the other direction. Yeah, obviously tensions, those tensions are arbitrated in the college and uh, those issues are being solved uh, efficiently. Now, obviously everyone can talk about the very special circumstances uh, that uh, led uh, to a paralysis for a certain point in time in the ratification of CETA because the veto by the by the uh, one uh, uh, subnational uh, authority. Okay, but I mean, then let's look into what first, finally, despite all of that, uh, CETA was ratified uh, in the Council, in the European uh, Parliament, it was a good vote. We still have the process of ratification in national parliaments because it was concluded uh, as a mixed uh, agreement. Now, Singapore, uh, Japan, uh, uh, Vietnam, uh, three very important agreements uh, were concluded as new only agreements and were adopted with a very strong uh, uh, support in the European Parliament and with full support uh, by all the all the all the member states. Obviously, some agreements are more challenging. And, uh, we will have we will have the opportunity to discuss uh, later the agreement uh, with Mercosur. But it's clear that there's a fundamental challenge relating to the situation to, of deforestation in the Amazon, on the change of environmental policies in Brazil under the Bolsonaro administration. And until one has found a way forward to solve that issue, it is clear that, that it would not be possible to, to ratify. The Mercosur agreement. But I think that on these issues, you have a, a unified uh, position within the European Commission. There may be different sensitivities, but a unified position within the European Commission. And then you basically need to get to the point where you find the necessary political support in the member states. And at the end of the day, you know, politics is the art of the possible. I mean, the, look into the United States. The United States at this point in time is totally paralyzed when it comes uh, to, to negotiating the trade agreements. And that's the reason why probably at this point in time, the Biden administration has made a deliberate policy of not negotiating trade agreements. That's not the situation in the European Union. Uh, sometimes trade agreements are difficult. Uh, and I think the proof of the proof is going to be in the eating, as, the, as, as they say. At the end of the day, you basically need to get the necessary political support within the Council and within the European Parliament. And that's, by the way, why this review of trade and sustainable development policies is going to be politically so, so important. It was a key for getting broad political support for trade agreements in the European Union is to get the balance right between openness and sustainability. I mean, you cannot deliver a trade agreement unless you include meaningful economic advantages, beneficial for both sides, but you cannot actually either ratify a trade agreement unless you can show that it's an agreement that makes a positive contribution towards sustainability. And that's the balance that you need to get right. And that, I think, is going to be the challenge when it comes to the ratification of further trade agreements in the European Union. As I said, I don't want to make predictions. I think let's watch this space over the next uh, three years and let's see after three years' time how many of these uh, different negotiations that have been referring to and then this agreement we have in global Union, how many of these have gone through the ratification procedure. Thank you very much. I think we have um, time for one last question, and then uh, we have a, lot of, a, a little coffee break and then go to the first round table. Yes, please. Yes, uh, hello. Thank you very much for um, your keynote speech. Uh, my name is Amelie Vandenberg. I work for Client Earth, a global environmental organization. And I have a question regarding the balance that you mentioned. Um, because clearly, the, the ambition of the European Commission on Sustainability is, I think, it's quite acknowledged that it's not yet there in practice. Um, and as you mentioned, it's DG Trade that is actually leading also the negotiations. Um, so when there is actually tensions between trade and sustainability priorities, um, how is that um, balance, actually this balancing in the science is made, especially knowing that, um, I mean, there is an involvement of uh, DG Environment and other non-trade um, departments, but it's, it's, um, it's a very weak engagement um, from, from that side. So, would it not help to actually improve the engagement of those um, non-trade departments of the European Commission, but also at the national level, because then it also foresees the implications at the ratification um, stage. So also in a way that uh, would ensure more legitimacy for decisions that are 
um, made by the by the Commission when negotiating trade agreements? Uh, I could not agree more. I mean, uh, I'm from the trade, but I can assure you, there's nothing that the trade appreciate more than having more commitment, more engagement. Uh, by other parts of the Commission that have an expertise on the matter, particularly when it comes to the sustainability dimension of our trade agreement, which I know is challenging because you know mm -hmm. we all have limited uh, resources. Our colleagues from the environment are very spent in terms of resources. Our colleagues from the employment uh, the same. So how to try to, to bring other parts of the Commission much more, not just to the negotiation, because even more important than the negotiation is the implementation. Uh, of the agreement. And I totally agree with you that it's also very important to get the expertise of the member states, particularly because of the knowledge of the situation on the ground. Because at the beginning, if you want to have sustainability uh, components which are more granular, which are more related to what really matters for the country concerned, you need to have a good understanding about what is happening in the, in the country. And for that, uh, your delegations mm -hmm. in the country concerned are particularly important. So one of the reflections that you will see when this communication comes forward is precisely how we can try to better integrate uh, the different parts of the Commission in the sustainability component of our trade agreements, uh, how we can also work better uh, with the member states and with the European Parliament, because of course the European Parliament has a strong interest on the sustainability <laughs> component of trade agreements, so what can be the role of the European Parliament also when it comes to the implementation of, of the sustainability component of trade agreements, and uh, also the role of civil society. So all of those elements are things that we will try to, to develop a few thoughts in the communication we will be putting the forward. And I totally agree with you that uh, for this to work, it's going to be important to find ways of uh, making this much more of an all commission effort, not just uh, the trade, but also those parts of the commission which have the expertise, the knowledge. Also, by the way, our colleagues in the impre, because the, um, we still see that the cooperation is key uh, for, the, for the sustainability component, and cooperation also implies that you need to look into the synergies between trade agreements and their uh, development cooperation instruments. Thank you very much. I'd like to take the opportunity again to thank uh, you for your for the great start in our discussion. Um, so that's the end of our first panel of the keynote speech. Um, I think we have 10, 15 minutes for a small copy, and then we will have round table number one about the uh, corporate sustainable due diligence legislative initiative. See you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.